Tyrion Lannister, the uh, dwarf character in Game of Thrones and in the Song of Ice and Fire, is I don't know, for me and for many, many, many others, for just about everyone, I think it's probably everyone's favourite character in Game in uh, Game of Thrones and in the Song of Ice and Fire. And he has this really memorable moment where he says, "I have a tender spot in my heart for cripples and bastards and broken things." So many, well, many of your characters, some of your characters are these outsiders. They're either different or they're disabled in some way like him. And they seem to be the only characters that are capable of true compassion. And yet they seem to suffer for it. They, it's, is this something you're conscious of doing, George, as you're writing the book? Yeah, definitely. I mean, yes, I have a large cast of viewpoint characters, but... but uh... For the most part, they all have something that makes them a, a bit of an outcast. You know, Tyrion is a is a dwarf. Uh, Jon Snow is a bastard, uh, and Danny, who's you know beautiful, is a penniless exile um, who's being essentially sold off in in marriage. You know, Arya is is uh, born to a noble house, um, but she's kind of those wild child who she doesn't conform with her proper gender roles. Brienne of Tarth even more doesn't conform to her proper gender roles and because of that she suffers a lot of scorn and and rejection because she's not a proper woman in in the terms of her society. Um, Sam Tarth Tarly is is fat and bookish when a lord is expected to be warlike and strong and fierce and good with a sword and Sam as pawn would rather read and dance and listen to music and so he suffers a lot of rejection and I could go on and on uh, but you know all of those people you're talking have this honor code as well uh, they're the characters who have an honor code within themselves that they almost need to hide right and and that seems to make life even more difficult for them in the world of Westeros. Even even a character like Theon Greyjoy, who's uh, not a character that a lot of people are fond of, because um, he's a weak character. Um, I mean, he's physically strong. He's he's very skilled with a bow. He's uh, you know a good warrior. Um, but he's he's a a character who's suffering a lot of confusion about his place in the world because, you know, he's born of a noble family, but his father raised a rebellion, and his elder brothers were killed during that rebellion, and he was handed over as a hostage at the end, theoretically a ward they called it, but still a hostage. If his father creates trouble, he's to be hung. You know, so that was a frequent practice in the Middle Ages when you didn't really trust one of your underlords or an enemy who had bent the knee. You took some of his children as wards or hostages and um so he he call, he he's a great joy by birth and uh by some standards he's the heir to to the iron islands but he's been raised in the household of Eddard stark and there's part of him who you know he has these two fathers looming over him neither one he, who, who he can ever quite please and he's desperate to find his place in the world as one or the other but from that confusion a great drama arises you know i mean i think the best fiction the best stories arise out of uh conflict i've always taken as my my mantra um william, william faulkner's nobel prize acceptance speech where he said the only thing worth writing about is the human heart and conflict with itself and uh I think that's true of all fiction, whether it's science fiction or fantasy or literary fiction or mystery fiction. The human heart in conflict with itself, the characters who are having problems, um, who are trying to decide the right thing to do, who are trying to make some sense of their life, who are trying to find their place in the world or or any of these issues. These, these are what make characters real. These are the things that real people do and... and um, that's the characters I love to read about. Those are the characters I love to write about. I mentioned earlier that so far, Song of Ice and Fire isn't following the hero's journey. It doesn't seem to be anyway. I wonder, are you consciously trying to discard that that old trope? Or do you feel still obliged to write within that thing? The heroes you know, go out to the world, they meet I've, challenges. I've never g- the end. given it much thought one way or the other. Um, Really? I mean, this is this is kind of a no, known template in Hollywood. Yeah. You've been a screenwriter. You would have been hit over the head with it many times, I would have thought. Yeah, but it doesn't interest me. You know, I, I read a lot of books. I get books sent to me all the time for blurbing. And, of course, I've been a voracious reader since I was a small child. And uh, one of the things that I learned um, 
when I was still a small child and a high school kid was that there would be certain patterns in in uh, um, storytelling that were very predictable, and I began to predict them. And I very quickly, even as a teenager, I lost interest in the predictable stories, the stories that went exactly where I wanted to uh, wanted to go. You know, we were we were talking uh, a little before the show about uh, our shared past in comic books. Yeah. Uh, you know, I my, my first first things I ever published were letters in, in the comic books of the uh, Marvel comic books of the early nineteen sixties, the Avengers and and uh, Fantastic Four and Spider Man and Me so too. forth. Um I was very impressed with those. And I was born in nineteen forty eight, so I started reading comics in the fifties, just around the time that the Silver Age began. The crime comics and horror comics were going out, superheroes were coming back after a, like a decade's absence. And at first they came back with D C with uh, Julius Schwartz editing and characters like uh, the Flash and Green Lantern and uh, the Justice League were brought back in new incarnations. And I loved these comics, but they were very predictable. It was you know, the Flash was a good guy, Green Lantern was a good guy. Uh, the Adam was a good guy. Hawkman was a good guy. They were all good guys, and every issue they fought a bad guy. And the bad guys weren't terribly bad in the fifties. They were mostly guys trying to rob banks, but they were just, uh, you know, they were they were bad guys. They were criminals, and uh, the the hero would catch them by the end of the book. And then next issue, there would be another bad guy who was trying to take over the world, or trying to rob a bank, or trying to get revenge, and uh, the hero would stop him. And then. Marvel came along and with Stan Lee writing, and uh, that was you know the first times I was writing letters and getting them published, and it was so revolutionary to me. It's it's hard to looking back for people who weren't there to conceive of how shocking these comics were because Stan Lee threw out the rules. I mean, with the Fantastic Four, the character of the Thing, he was a monster. He he looked like the early Marvel monster comics. He was like made of orange rocks, and he had a ferocious temper. And he he didn't want to be the thing. He was like this tragic hero, and he would go into rages, and he would fight with uh, Mr. Fantastic. Mr. Or, Fantastic, or Torch. Yes. yeah. In the early issues, he had a thing for Sue Storm too, and he and Reed Richards were both interested in the same girl. That never happened at DC, you know. Superman had Lois Lane, you know. You never saw Batman hitting on Lois Lane. <laughs> Batman had his own his own girlfriend, you know. The Flash, mind, the, very the Flash had his own girlfriend, you know. People didn't. Everything was was very much in order in DC, and over in in Marvel, it was it was just chaos. Characters who didn't like each other, characters who didn't want to be heroes. And then, like, one of the early letters I, I had printed was uh, the an issue of The Avengers, where a character called Wonder Man was introduced. And he was this great new hero, Wonder Man, and he, he joined the Avengers, but he seemed to be a good guy, but he was actually a bad guy who had been sent to undermine the Avengers. But at the end, he turned out to be a good guy, because he couldn't go through it being a bad guy, and he died in the same issue. This great new hero died in the same issue as he was introduced. It had a tremendous impact on me. It was, it was like Stan was saying no one is safe anything can happen in these books you know all of these things are off the off the table and of course it was comics they brought him back you know a couple of years later but uh still the fact that he died it was a it was a tragic story here and the, the thing coming to that as a 13 and 14 year old i was tremendously impressed with that and i've always remained impressed with uh with stories where you don't know what was going to happen i mean um no one is safe anything can happen Yes, and Tolkien, you know, in some ways led the way for that. I mean, the, the Fellowship of the Ring set out, and, you know, the death of Boromir had enormous impact on me. And then the seeming death of Gandalf, uh, you know, that incredible moment in, in a Fellowship of the Ring where, where the Balrog drags Gandalf down into the abyss and you think he's dead. You think he's dead for, you know, a good part of the rest of that book and the first part of the next book. Um if it had been me, I probably would have let him stay dead uh, because the impact of losing Gandalf, Gandalf was the leader. He was the one who knew what was going to happen. He was the, the father figure, the wise guy. He, he he always could tell you what to do and what was the meaning of this. And now it was like the children are yeah. in charge. The, the Father's uh, dead. Father's dead. Yeah. What are you going to do now? Yeah. Now you have to save the world. Oh, God, what a feeling that was. And, you know, that set me up perfectly for then the end of uh, uh, the second book, The Two Towers, when it seems as though Frodo is dead. Frodo's been stung by Shelob, and Sam takes the ring, and he leaves Frodo, and I was this 
reeling and saying, my God, they've killed. I thought Frodo was a hero. They've killed Frodo. How could he do this? You know, and I really didn't know what was going to happen at the end of that book. And that's the feelings that I had reading those things are the feelings that I try to uh, replicate uh, for, for my readers. 